Perfect. All right. So hello and welcome to Athabasca University's Q&A panel on the quality of open educational resources. Um, before we begin, I'd like to situate our conversation by stating that as an online university, Athabasca University respectfully acknowledges that we are on and work on the, the traditional lands of the Indigenous peoples of Canada. We honor the ancestry, heritage, and gifts of the Indigenous peoples and give thanks to them. I would also like to take the opportunity to discuss the uh, format of this panel. And a conversation it will be for we invite any attendees to participate with questions at any point. You can unmute your mic or you can raise your hand or you can drop your questions in the chat. Um, there's no real um, order to things, so we're, we're happy to pause and, and, and answer questions at any time. Um, interesting to see where the conversation goes. Um, with that being said, we will ask attendees to please mute your microphone and turn off your video unless you are asking a question uh, in order to accommodate those with low bandwidth. So I think we're ready to dive right in. So first off, my name is Dan Cocroft and I'm Athabasca University's new OER librarian. Um, please give a warm welcome to our panelists, uh, Dr. Connie Blomgren, Michael Dabrowski, Dr. David Anand, and Dr. Dietmar Kennepal. Connie, could you start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Okay, thanks very much, Dan, and welcome to everyone. Very exciting to see everyone here as part of Open Education Week. I'm an associate professor in the Masters of Education in Open Digital and Distance Education here at Athabasca University. And also I have uh, other uh, different uh, connections to openness. Uh, I am also an associate editor of the International Review of Open and Distributed Learning alongside um, Dietmar. So Erodal is a well-ranked, uh, highly ranked um, open access uh, journal. Additionally, I am a member of the um, International Council for Distance Education OER Advocacy Committee and also a director with Open Education Global. And Open Ed Education Global is the, um, as the name indicates, a global organization of uh, institutes of higher learning who have been working to develop uh, awareness and support for OER for um, I'm not sure, I think I want to say 15 years, I'm, I'm not sure about the exact long timeline. And in fact, Open Education Week was uh, one of their main ideas, and that's partly how we're here today is through the work of Open Education Global. Great, thank you. Michael, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Uh, certainly. So I'm Michael Dabrowski. I'm an academic coordinator of Spanish at Athabasca University. I'm also enrolled in the uh, EdD program at Athabasca, focusing on open pedagogy and, and OERs. So this is uh, kind of my lifeblood in a way. Um, I've been involved in OERs for the last, I'd say, 10 plus years, um, focusing mostly on open pedagogy and sort of running a dynamic classroom. So I think a lot of my comments will be um, sort of angled from that direction. Um, I'm a former president of the Canadian uh, National Network for Education, uh, Innovation and Education, uh, CNIE. So I strongly recommend for those of you who are interested to get involved in that as well as a plug. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's about it for me. Great, thank you. Um, how about you, David? Do you mind introducing yourself? Thank you, Dan. Uh, my name is Dave Anand. I'm a full professor in accounting at the, in the Faculty of Business. My invo involvement with OER started in 1995 when uh, a textbook we used in one of our high school courses in the university went out of print. I approached the author. Uh, the copyright had reverted back to him. I approached him about revising and updating the text, and we did that and used the material in Accounting 253. From that, the estate of the author agreed to uh, issue the text as OER. And then my other involvement involved the uh, development of some basically ground up material after that point. I'm not sure that's the focus of our talk today, 
Uh, so my involvement in OER, though fairly long term, has only involved one project where I've actually taken and adapted the material. The rest has been uh, developed by me. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, Dietmar, tell us a bit about yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, glad to be here. Um, I'm Dietmar Kanapol. I'm a, a professor of chemistry at Athabasca University and a former associate vice president academic. And uh, I think uh, my, my connections to, um, you know, open uh, educational resources is, is twofold. I think uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm also a um, associate uh, editor with Erodal, as is Connie. And um, more recently, I've um, uh, switched out my commercial textbook for my courses, uh, organic chemistry courses, and have replaced them with a with a you know open educational resource, essentially a wiki that the students and staff write and rewrite and um, develop as they go along. So it really becomes the you know the students' textbook. And I would say probably in general, like many of us at Athabasca University, you know, our mission statement of, you know, breaking down barriers to um, university level education, you know, I really believe in that. And so, you know, ideas like open learning and open research kind of come quite naturally. So I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thanks, Dietmar, that's great. Uh, so nice to hear from everyone. Um, I think a great starting point for our discussion is to define exactly what an open educational resource is. Uh, so the UNESCO definition of OER frames them as teaching and learning, teaching, learning and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use, adaptation and redistribution with others with no or limited restrictions. So in your, your introductions, you've touched on a bit of your experiences with OER, and it's clear that these materials can take on a lot of different uh, contexts. Uh, can I ask you each to expand on that a little bit? I, I know um, I've heard so many interesting ways that you've used OER. Uh, maybe, um, Connie, you can start. OK, well, thanks. Um, well, there's many. Okay, I always, sometimes I call OER um, a gateway drug into openness because, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and, they're, and they're laughing because, or it's, it seems to be that people are interested in OER and, uh, and dive into that and then they start to recognize that there are, are these branches, these connections into other areas like Dietmar has mentioned, like open science, open data, open access journal. Um, software, of course, is part of its history. And so um, my beginnings with OER primarily came when I started working full time here at Athabasca and um, Rory McGreal, who is a, a professor here at Athabasca and is a UNESCO chair in OER. And I believe, I think I look to see I think there's something like 245 UNESCO chairs and I think of those 245 in the world I think there's about 40 or so that are related to open education or openness in science some kind of connection that way so uh, Rory was with our um, at the time it's called the Center for Distance Education and he would say oh OER, we've got to do more with OER. He was such an, you know, still is such an advocate for OER. So I have to say, um, Rory really um, encouraged me to understand what participatory technologies, um, the open licenses, and what OER can do for all levels of education. And um, my background, I worked in K-12 for many years, and they have, uh, actually quite a bit of catching up to do to catch up with higher ed and the understanding of OER. So I applied for some funding and I created some podcasts and videos about uh, educating K-12 uh, teachers about the benefits of OER. And so that would be my sort of origin story and it's branched off into lots of different kinds of projects and I could go on and on. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Connie. Uh, 
Michael, what does OER look like in your courses? Okay, so so I, I'll just second Connie's uh, drug metaphor. Um, I think it's really apt. Um, once you take a bit of OER, you can't go back. Um, and similar to Dietmar, I, I started off in the same ways, uh, having to revise courses over and over again because publisher discontinues a book or something like that is frustrating. Um, and there's no control. So it's a question of gaining some control. That was kind of the, the gateway in. But realistically, I found that right now, anything that's licensed uh, under a Creative Commons license is an OER if used appropriately. So, um, uh, you know, obviously stuff on YouTube, uh, things in Wikipedia, all of those tools and content are kind of free game um, if you use them properly. Um, and so realistically, I've gone to the point where most of the OERs that I use are developed by me or my students. Um, but they're adapted from other places under the appropriate uh, licensing. Um, I've gotten an Alberta grant to uh, develop a Spanish OER. Um, I've had um, multiple grad students and undergrad students working on other projects. So it's it, it really spreads very quickly. Once you're willing to move away from those publisher textbooks, there's really nothing you can't do, and that's the exciting part. That's great. Thanks, Michael. I'm really interested in how students are integrated into that process, and we'll talk a bit about that later. Um, next, I'll ask David, what does OER look like in your courses? Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Very interesting comments from Michael and uh, Connie. Um, different paths I think we've all taken. Uh, for instance, I only have one OER material. Uh, text officially, that text that we started in 1995 that morphed into OER is actually the only material that I have out in OER. I have three textbooks that I've written for courses at AU that are AU copyrighted or in the process of being developed. And because of the policies at, at AU at this point, um, none of those have been licensed as OERs. So there is a bit of a conflict between taking material that exists already, using it, and also then developing material in our courses and licensing this OER. It's a different issue that I think we need to be aware of. Um, my material has all been developed by me, um, and I'm, you know, I'm glad or I like to hear that students have been involved. I think that's the way it should be with OER. It was just a difficult. Uh, environment for me to work in you know it's a fairly the texts that i have written are fairly uh, skill oriented uh, it takes some expertise to understand what's going on um, and so it's basically fallen to me but fortunately you know in my workload at au i've been able to do that but in other senses uh, my experience has been very limited with oer in terms of actually embracing i think some of the concepts of openness that are inherent in the, in the concept Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. That's definitely a journey for sure. Um, how about you, Dietmar? How, how, how is OER used in your courses? Uh, you're muted. You're talking, you to, my, talking to myself again. <laughs> done a lot of that in the last couple of years. So um, yeah, I mean, unlike, uh, uh, you know, Connie and Michael, I mean, I, you know, I don't kind of view this as kind of a, a drug in that way, but like Michael, I was kind of getting um, kind of fed up with commercial textbooks that would basically, they would just, you know, change, uh, you know, to a new edition every three years presumably to kind of, you know, curb the, you know, uh, used textbook market, that sort of thing. And it had meant, you know, a lot of work, um, you know, on my part and, you know, the, the, the course team that we would have in trying to, you know, essentially use our EU model of wrap around a commercial textbook with our study materials and so on. And so wanting to have a bit more control um, I, I was kind of leaning towards that, but I think the, you know, kind of a Malcolm Gladwell tipping point sort of way, I think 
what really pushed me over was, you know, realizing my students, you know, for example, in organic chemistry, they're paying, you know, $200, $250 just in, you know, course materials. Um, and that that price was just, you know, as far as I could tell, was just going up and up and up. And I thought this was ridiculous. So I was looking at, at other paths. And so that's how I got into it. And uh, so essentially replaced the commercial text with uh, essentially a wiki. And one of the interesting parts of the course is that the students, as I mentioned, can contribute to the textbook. And so uh, it's a little bit more work in the sense that I have to be careful about versioning, of course, and about the quality of the stuff that goes in there, but they get to participate in it. And I have colleagues participating in that from other institutions as well. And um, it's, it's kind of exciting. It's not perfect, but uh, I think I think it's uh, it's a really uh, a different way of doing things. And um, you know, I, I can only speak well about it. So um, I'll just leave it there for now. Maybe uh, we have some other, uh, you know, I've I've got you know kind of more political statements on things like you know like open journals and things like that. So, uh, but I'll leave that for later. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Dietmar. Um, so I think now's a great time to bring in the other or the big part of the conversation. That's quality. Um, so before I ask my next question, uh, I'd like to say after we discuss this initially, um, I'll be looking to the audience for, for any questions. So make sure you have those ready if you have anything. And um, we'll talk about quality. So we know some open knowledge platforms like Wikipedia have a negative reputation when it comes to quality, um, or at least they used to. Um, I feel like in some ways, other platforms and other mediums like YouTube videos, for example, kind of struggle with that same perception today. And in a similar way, there are still pockets of academia that see we are um, as having questionable quality. So do you think that open resources face the same quality issues as traditional publishers or traditional publisher materials? And how would you address those still unsure about OER? And that's an open question for, for anyone who feels they have an answer. Well, I don't know if I have an answer, but um, I can maybe start with a few initial comments. Um, I I think, you know, it's it's a good question because it's it's I th I think of it as very much kind of like Wikipedia where you're essentially crowdsourcing and so you 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 have a lot of really good creative things there but you have what I also like to call a lot of dreck and so um, you know uh, things like Wikipedia they try to mitigate some of that by having you know volunteer editors kind of go through and they try to rely on you know people calling each other out on on facts and so on that doesn't always work 100 percent but the idea is if you have enough people looking at it um and and contributing to it you should get a better and better product um there's a few problems with that because not every every topic has a lot of people looking at it so i could go on wikipedia and write a you know story about myself you know being the king of alberta and and all sorts of things and probably no one would notice or respond to it but that <laughs> doesn't make for a very high quality piece so i i think you know you you get everything in there and uh i think maybe you know one of the things we might want to consider too is wh what do we mean by quality right so um it's it's a different sort of thing for different people I remember uh, many years ago going to a um, a conference and someone was presenting about quality and they 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 had this analogy of a bridge and they said, well, you know, if if uh, you know the the Japanese were to build a quality bridge, all the pieces would just fit perfectly together and and so on. If the French said, oh, this is a quality bridge, it would be very artistic and creative. If the Germans were building one, it would be, you know, a quality bridge would be, you know, can carry a lot of weight, you know. So it it really depends too on what we mean by quality, and that can mean different things in different areas. So I think as we we talk about quality in this area, um, that's probably something 
something to keep in mind. So uh, maybe I'll let others kind of jump in with their thoughts and we'll go from there. So ahead, I, I think if, if, if I can just throw in a couple sentences, sure. um, I, I think there needs to be kind of a division between the pedagogical quality and sort of the appearance physical quality of the OERs. Um, and I think both need need to be present at some point. So you can have some notes on a piece of paper and they can be absolutely fabulous learning materials. But when students and other professors look at this material, they laugh it off. So there needs to be that balance of that sort of curb appeal of the OER and then the pedagogical content and marry those two together. That's I think been the biggest criticism is that the publisher's textbooks, they look professional and the OERs don't. And that, that's been the big obstacle in overcoming to have the OERs look professional. Dave, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, I was really uh, reading over the notes actually. I, were these all distributed to the participants in this? You know, for instance, the UNESCO context, and it's just who will guarantee the quality of OER. Is that available for all the participants? Yeah. Can you be, repeat the last part of that question? I have notes regarding this uh, lunch hour meeting. Yeah. And it, in my notes, it's there's a section on UNESCO context, and one of the contact, one of the topics is who will guarantee the quality of OER. Yes. I found that if that's available to everybody, I found that very helpful in terms of addressing quality. I mean, it really brings it down to saying, yes, there's lots of different material, but it's really up to the educator, as it's always been, to choose which what is appropriate for their courses. You know? Within the AU context, I, I think we have to remember that we have a unique course production process that is just not mimicked in other institutions, by and large, and that that also um, holds us as professors or developers, initial developers of where we are, it kind of holds us our feet to the fire to ensure that by the end of that process, the materials are fairly, you know, are very high quality and that things like accessibility uh, are considered in the development of them. Um. And well, I think that idea of quality has always been part of the conversation around OER, but it's been uh, around. And as time has um, evolved, the quality of OER has also evolved, even you know how it looks, because that first impression is an important part of how people perceive and want to use a resource. So the question of quality goes right back to the very beginning, you know, the early 2000s when uh, OER was initiated. Um, so it is, you know, whose definition of quality is important to consider. Um, also, those aesthetic pieces are part of it as well. But what I've noticed in the last five years, especially, is that I, I think there is this greater uptake and interest and awareness of OER and also the sophistication around, you know, what does good look, what what is good quality OER. And there's been several reports and you know research into that that area and the has several articles around that very topic of you know how do you assess quality in oer so you know and those go back to like 2014 and and even earlier so it's been around for a while this this concern around quality but it also begs the question i think terry anderson would say maybe something like how do we how why is it that we trust the quality of a publisher and if we look at um, certain parts well the publishing industry and how certain populations are targeted for the creation of a text um, like in the us uh, in k-12 they specifically uh, try to develop a textbook for either texas or california so if you're from any other parts of the US, you won't really see the representation of, you know, the people that live and um, who will be studying and using that textbook. So publishers have always been paying attention to the big areas of, of demographics. And um, 
So is that quality when we have populations that are not represented, right? It, it moves into areas of equity, diversity, inclusion, in my, my thinking. Absolutely. Go ahead, David. There's also a question of purpose. You know, you can hi have high quality OER that just isn't suitable for your particular educational setting. You know, I found a lot of material that good. It. Maybe it's in audio visual form or something that made me too much to put it in as a course. And also the assessment question. You know, there's always seems to be the need to develop a good assessment from the material. Unless there's some explanatory material but really to encourage students to embrace the knowledge through assessments, that seems to be a piece that always needs to be happening. So I think David makes a really um, great point um, that maybe it's not always quality, but it's the fit um, that you have with the material. And really, as he pointed out earlier, it's, it's you know, the, you know, the, the course instructor that is really you know able to kind of figure out what the context is and, and how uh, you know whether it's an entire course or a learning object within a course how it is how it's used and um you know how does how does it work within your course or you know what the students are seeing so i think that's that's an important piece of it so it's not just straight out quality because I mean, in the past, you know, we've had lots of um, repositories and some of them have had people come in and and basically rate various uh, learning objects. Um, but you still have to kind of uh, think about how it's being used in your context. And so that can mean a lot of a lot of different things. So um, it's it's uh, it's not a very linear sort of uh, problem to solve. Absolutely, and I love how um, you're all of you are getting ahead of all my questions. So that's oh, wonderful. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're seeing where I'm going. Um, I think this is a great time to take a little pause and ask uh, anyone if they'd like to ask a question. You're welcome to drop that in the chat or um, unmute yourself and ask it. And we'll give everyone a moment because I know it takes a while to to type. Oh, we have a question already. How are savings associated with OERs realized in each of your courses? Do students benefit or AU or both? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that, Bob. I mean, um, you know, we do have like a learning resources fee and this has been kind of a perennial <laughs> discussion point is, OK, so now as we're moving to OERs, um, what what sort of benefit are we going to pass on to the student? And so there have been uh, various models of that. When we, you know, a few of us in uh, Faculty of Science, when we were starting to come out with um, courses that were using OERs, we asked, like, could we at least get a token, you know, $50 off your tuition for, you know, like off the, you know, learning resources fee. Now, to be fair, there are other things that are under the learning resources fee. Um, you know, it's not just the, the textbook, as it were, but um, it's uh, certainly, uh, I guess, an ongoing discussion that we have at Athabascan University as to, um, you know, uh, how we how we share the the cost savings of of all this between the institution and the student. Absolutely. Dave, you have your hand up, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, as yeah, an example of the savings, uh, the accounting 253 textbook that ended up as an OER and it's used in the accounting 253. Uh, an equivalent introductory financial accounting textbook that costs about $200 Canadian. There's 1,300 students a year in that course, and it's, if you assume, a three year revision cycle. Um, Ignoring for now the inner development costs, the AU development costs, that's a $780,000 it's saved in terms of textbook purchases. In terms of passing that on to students, I mean, to me as an accountant, it's sort of a red herring because you might pass, say, $50 or $100 on this to the student because you, of course, can use OER. 
but then the overall budgeting process of the university tuition fees are going to be increased proportionally to, to offset that so to me the question is that i i think there's savings that can be realized by using what we are and to the extent that it keeps our overall budgetary cost down then it benefits both students and the community. that's a great point Michael or Connie, did you want to uh, touch on that question at all? Well, I was just going to add that often OER uh, are conflated from the point of view of from the point of view of students as as being free, but as we know, there's nothing in life that's really t totally free, and so there's the cost of the association of you know curating the OER, um, putting it into the LMS. Um, all those steps, like part of your role as an OER librarian, Dan, and you know other aspects. So um, there is a cost, and sometimes uh, that um, the free part of you know student textbooks is one that in higher education is that has been you know there's been a lot of attention to that, and like a Z degree or a Z degree as they call it in the states, where you can take a, a college course. A college degree without ever paying for a textbook and um, they have that also at KPU in uh, in British Columbia so this idea of cost from the point of view of the student versus cost to the institution right there there has to be understanding that free is not a hundred percent free when it comes to OER that's a great point and then, so then I'll just add to that is uh, part of the, the free was initially, I think, a sales pitch to convince everybody that OER has value, and it does. Uh, it does save students money, but I think it has turned into more of a marketing slogan now where it kind of uh, saves the hurt of the skyrocketing tuition fees. So we're trying to use the OER and the savings, the vast savings to everybody as a way to blunt the fact that we're actually doubling and tripling the tuition fees. So it's, it's part of the messaging now, I think, more than just the savings. I think it brings up a good point about the financial models that underpin OER. We've talked about the specifics of AU, but it's a very unique environment. Within AU, with the cost of textbook being incorporated in the tuition fees, it's very unusual. But the one thing it does do is it aligns the financial interests of the administration and professors and students all together. In a traditional university where students have to go out and buy a textbook from, say, the, the bookstore, well, the university is making money on that. But and the problem is, the professor at an institution like that has no incentive to develop OERs. They get no workload relief from doing it, from teaching. Um, they lose, if they develop OER, they lose the ability to bring in a commercial textbook that may have all sorts of teaching aids that make their job easier. So from their point of view, they want a commercial textbook. From a student's point of view, or when they look at it from a student's point of view, it doesn't really affect them. There's no financial incentive. There's a moral incentive to help students save money. But if a professor at most institutions wants to develop OER, it costs them in real terms and in, in, in time and effort, unsupported time and effort, basically. Absolutely. I'm seeing we're getting so many great questions uh, in the chat, so let's go through some of those. I think we kind of addressed um, Lorraine Thirsk's uh, question about justifying uh, charging for course materials and then providing them YouTube videos and blogs that are insufficient. Um, certainly there are some cases where students are paying course material fees and the textbook isn't being used to any great extent. And that's uh, something where open absolutely uh, has a place to 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 um, help solve that problem. Um, Christopher asks a great question about how is the panel navigating the equ equity and ethical issues? Um, there's probably other ways to think about that too in in terms of how that relates to quality um i know um 
I've watched some previous panels from uh, our attendees today, so I know they have perspectives on this. Um, let's start with Michael. Um, I know um, the way you're using um, OER allows for different perspectives. Could you touch on that a little bit? OK, so. Yeah, d depending on which courses, obviously, but uh, I, I have an OER where the students are essentially the authors of the bulk of the content of the OER. Um, it's a Spanish course and uh, the course is based on the UNESCO Sustainable Goals. Um, that's the course content and they develop materials in Spanish to practice writing, speaking and doing all of those components uh, based on that subject matter. Um, the, the perspective is different because every student comes with a different background. Um, I have obviously a few students that are Spanish majors and stuff, but overall second year course, students from business, chemistry, physics, you name it, they're taking extra credits, they, they want to fill their humanities requirements. They have a boyfriend or girlfriend that speaks Spanish or whatever. Whatever the motivator is for people, they're taking Spanish credits. Um, so the, the perspectives are vast. Um, the uh, sustainable goals really cover all of human experience. So the students get to write about whatever they feel is relevant or of value in human experience. So the, the perspectives are phenomenally diverse. Um, there are, however, if we're talking about sort of inclusiveness and all of this, if we're talking about EDI and access, uh, the content, because it's student developed, doesn't meet some of the rigors that you would need to, to claim that it is open and accessible to everyone. And I think that's really something that we need to stress as well is uh, it, it's really crippling for people who are using OER to say that they must make it accessible to everyone for it to qualify as an OER. And there are a lot of people who believe that unless it is accessible to anyone for free, then it's not an OER. And I, I don't agree with that. They're, they're open tools, they're educational resources. Can they be improved? Yes. Um, but to give full access to everyone will drive costs up again. So we're constantly balancing that. But having multiple authors really opens up the, the content to different perspectives. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, when we think about EDI, there's, there's all kinds of different ways we can go with that. Um, I guess to word it a different way, um, how can we see that OER um, allows for us to implement more um, thinking around EDI? If that makes sense. Well, um, maybe this is kind of a philosophical answer, but um, I think it's kind of a double-edged sword in the sense that, okay, so you have this, this extra openness, so you're not chained by, you know, what uh, a commercial textbook might have or, you know, uh, something that's that's kind of locked in. It's open. But on the other hand, just like, uh, you know, I, I said with, uh, you know, Wikipedia and that it's also open that you get all sorts of stuff coming in. And so maybe some of that has to be has to be vetted and analyzed before you use it. Right. So so you, you know, you get you get some good stuff coming in, but you get some maybe not so good stuff. And and so and, it, and it's also discipline um, kind of specific because, um, you know, when I was listening to Michael talk about his course, you know, I'm thinking in in the sciences, you know, I teach chemistry. It's, it's a little bit different um, in the sense that, you know, like, uh, you know, what are the ethical implications of, you know, a hydrogen atom, like, you know, and, and you're trying to describe, you know, nature and, and so on. Um, you do have certainly bigger issues that are maybe not, 
you know, connected with, um, you know, OERs, just in general, like how we present science is very, you know, much a, a, a Western view. If you take any chemistry course in, you know, in the Western world, um, but, you know, using open materials, you can also include other perspectives as well, um, potentially. So, um, you know, it's it's uh, you know the, my bigger problem for a science course might be in in uh, handling misconceptions, which is something that uh, you know is a scientific misconceptions that come in, uh, especially if you have open educational resources and that it, it can kind of reinforce things. So you know there are other other fish to fry as well. So um, it was just interesting. I think. Um, Probably if you went over to David in, in business or other areas too, they, they might have their own kind of uh, culture or things that they're dealing with, um, you know, that, that are connected with, you know, ethical considerations and EDID and, and, and so on. Yeah, and it might be a, a great time to also point out that uh, we all love open, but uh, we do want to say that open is good and closed is bad. There's obviously, um, uh, a time and a place, uh, and we, we want to make sure that students have choice. Um, and there's certainly some uh, places like traditional knowledge that needs to stay closed. Uh, so we have so many questions in the chat, so uh, let's try and work on some more. We have a question from Dr. Bob Heller. Was the perception of freeness trading off with the perception of quality? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I think obviously, you know, I'm not a marketing major, but from what I understand, if you have a sense of uh, high quality, it's often associated with with cost, right? So um, that idea of free and therefore not necessarily being high quality is you know, a perception that's out there. Um, and I, I think it's always part of uh, helping people develop OER awareness and understanding uh, as part of building OER readiness. And so the perception of free and um, quality. Yeah, I know that that's something that I've heard before in other places. Yeah. So just just a quick comment. Um, you know the perception might be there that it's it's they're inversely proportional but uh the reality is is not always so i remember several years ago mit had this big campaign where they would take i think it was over 800 of their courses and they just made them open to anyone who wanted to use them and uh of course you know the mit has a really good brand name and you think immediately quality right but as you started drilling down into a lot of those courses, they were actually just videotaping professors' lectures in the lecture theater. So you got the the back of somebody on a chalkboard uh, mumbling away on something you can't quite read what they're writing, and you'd get hours and hours of this sort of stuff. And and so you know, yeah, MIT should you know if they've got the brand and they should have the quality but it wasn't really there so i think sometimes the perception and the reality are are a little bit different that's great um so many great questions in the chat so thank you for that um michelle johnson asks can we offset the temporal cost of an oer by pushing for oer creation to be included in tenure and promotion considerations Um, well, I'll speak. I know that at UBC in their um, teaching track uh, for faculty, because they do have some that are in that at UBC, uh, development of OER is considered part of their tenure and promotion process. And there has been some development. Uh, Amanda Coolidge from um, EC campus has done some work and has published a paper around that as well. Um, so I think to me, especially at AU, I would love to see that. And um, I think it would be an important part of um, 
you know, what it means to be um, teaching and researching here at AU. Uh, but additionally, there's also all the supports that come with this. It's not just, you know, it's not just sort of one person doing it, uh, as some of the comments in the chat have shown. So it's obvious that as a subject matter expert, professors have lots of information and content to share, but it's also a variety of skill sets that come around with it in not just creating, but then maintaining. And so to me, it's it's a bigger picture than, than just that one piece. Absolutely. Uh, it, it seems like that's one of the, the next big steps uh, that we need to take. It's so important. Um, lots of chat going on here. I think I'll, we have about 13 minutes left, so I'd like to um, hop on to another question that I've been uh, dying to ask everyone, and that's um, about integrating student perspectives into um, an open resource, and how does that affect quality, and how do you assess that when you have that component? I think um, Dietmar and Michael might have some some thoughts on this. Well, um, I, I've been doing this in, in uh, my organic chemistry courses, so um, students will, um, you know, I invite them to if they see errors, errors, or if they're having uh, problems with certain sections, to help help rewrite them, like provide a, you know a better question or rewrite a passage or so on. But we do that um, in collaboration because. Um, you know, so I don't just kind of hand it over to them and they can just just write anything they want. So um, we, we kind of do this together. And for for some students, it's it's really great because that participation, um, it I think it does a lot for them. Like a, you know, I, I give them some extra marks, you know, some bonus marks. Um, uh, so they have some recognition for that. But I think, for me, it's it's important, especially in the in in science, for students to realize that yes, you have this textbook there, but that's not it. It's not frozen in time, and that's the answer. Science is something that's living. It's changing. It's constantly new theories. We discover new things. Um, there's different ways of interpreting and looking at things. So it's it's it moves along, and I think for someone who participates in uh, doing some of this writing and some polishing on on some of the the course materials that are in there and open to everyone, um, it's not only a sense of pride, but that realization that that uh, science is a living thing and it, and it keeps moving on. So I, I find that personally uh, important, and uh, for the students that participate, I think I think they get a lot out of it, uh, more so than just you know here's the content and, you know, get ready for your final exam. So, so I'll echo everything that Dietmar says, even though it has nothing to do with chemistry. <laughs> um, the, the students, uh, I also have collaborative uh, marks where they actually edit each other's works. So they are learning grammar and then they are applying the grammar and then they are editing other students grammar explaining their errors in grammar uh, explaining how the content may be reorganized in their opinion to improve it and so on and so forth so on top of them being told how to write an essay then they're reviewing other people's essays improving their essays and so on so that's all enforcing that learning the language learning process and usually when you teach you gain better mastery of what you teach than when you're just learning it. So they're applying it and internalizing it a lot better. So I think it works really, really well. Um, the textbook uses a lot of short stories that were written by the students. So, you know, second year students writing short stories in Spanish um, and then having them published. So obviously there are issues with the final quality of the work, even with student edited work. So before I go to publish it in the OER, I pass it through some graduate students that I know and then a couple of colleagues who are professors. Uh, so we basically have sort of a an editorial board going in before the thing is published 
because the students are putting their names on this. So the last thing you'd want to do is have a student put out a poor quality work and have their name on it, and then people can look at it and kind of mock it uh, and stuff like that. So that's really important. But like Dietmar was saying as well, we're not perfect. So there are commas missing, periods missing, those kinds of things throughout the OER. And the students get bonus marks for finding errors, and then we can correct them. The textbook's all digital, so as soon as an error is found, I can correct it on the spot and we move on. So they're very involved in the content as they're going through the content. I think it's better for engagement and learning. And they cooperate, which is kind of novel in this world. <laughs> I think you know both Dietmar and Michael are talking about open pedagogy and as I mentioned earlier one thing leads to another and so like when you're talking about peer review and I mean there's different um, frameworks around open pedagogy but you know there's one that I, I turn to quite a bit uh, by Bronwyn Hegarty and at the center is open pedagogy and then there's eight attributes and one of the attributes is peer review and so um, you know, it's a, it's a dynamic kind of interaction, but this uh, the, the affordances of the participatory technologies is part of how this co-creating knowledge together, co-constructing curriculum together is possible. So we're starting to, in my opinion, move into the affordances of educational technologies with open pedagogy. I found with my OER textbook out on the market, it's listed with BC Commons and several sites, open education sites in the States. The issue is when an error or a change has been noted and even communicated to you, how do you distribute that across all those sites to make sure that people are accessing the most recent and up-to-date material? It's a, it can be a real problem. Absolutely. Um, what I'm, I'm getting from all this is that OER is really um, helping the process of learning how to learn. Um, hopefully that's a, a safe assumption or um, a safe um, kind of uh, the words escape me. <laughs> but I think this is a great time to um, ask the audience for one last question. If there's anybody else who has any th other thoughts. Um, this is a perfect opportunity. All right, well, I'm sure people are typing at the moment. I will uh, continue on with our last question of the day. Oh, there's our question. Perfect. Um, I will read it out because it's quite long. This is by Tina Peterson. Um, great panel, panel and information. Thank you. Appreciate the driver to reduce cost to students. I am with accessibility services here at Athabasca. We often struggle to provide more than one mode of delivery to our unique learners. This means we provide materials to students with a wide variety of challenges, such as ADHD, read, listen, and watch, or profound memory issues as a result of recent intense chemotherapy multiple repetitions and delivery modes, or visually impaired students that require braille conversation. For example, some learners really benefit from YouTube links and podcasts as well as the course material. Is there a chance we are moving on to YouTube and visual learning? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, because the, the ability to share multimodal digital assets, uh, the static written word is being uh, flipped, amplified and changed, in my opinion. Um, I'd be curious to hear from Dietmar if, and Michael if uh, students are in, you know, including images and video clips, audio clips, you know, different ways of representing knowledge. But from from what I observe, yes. Yeah, I would agree with Connie. Um, we're finding that uh, both students and instructors are doing a, a little bit more than that. I mean, 
And, and the one comment I would have is, you know, um, a lot of universal design, because I know this question's um, coming from accessibility services, but a lot of universal design um, meant to kind of like um, target, you know, certain problems is, is quite often is a benefit to everybody. And I'm just finding that, um, you know, having, um, you know, a little bit more visually rich uh, or different sorts of activities and that, and not just text, because one of the, you know, I had complained before about uh, MIT and, and, you know, endless videotapes of people, um, you know, <laughs> talking about their discipline. Well, the other thing that I saw during the pandemic is uh, what I would call uh, text dumps so that uh, people would say, oh, well, we're online now and, you know, I'm going to give you three times the material that we would have in the course and it's up to you to wade through it all. And to me, this is this is not this is not good teaching. This is <laughs> this is um, yeah. So um, if you can break it up a little bit and, and do those things, I, I think that's great. One of the things that it, it remind Tina's question reminds me of is is um, I don't know if in our rush to do all these these OERs and that quite often I think we we forget about universal design and access. So I don't know how many of us actually adopt materials and then kind of forget about well how accessible is this to everybody. OK, so even if we have images and that, well, if, if someone can't see the images, how do they, you know, how do they access that and so on? So I think I think that's, um, you know, for people who are using OERs is something to re to remember is as you're assessing them and thinking about how useful they are for your course is to also kind of think about those universal design aspects, too. It's nothing that money can't solve. And I think we have to recognize that, a, that in AU, we have a unique environment where the savings are retained within the university. It's not just a matter of cost savings. It's a matter of cost redistribution. If we save money on buying commercial textbooks, we have to invest in more course production staff, librarians, database administrators, and people who develop uh, the needed accessibility uh, that, we, that we require in our courses. I mean, it's a policy. To include that but that's the encouraging thing to me if we're smart about this we have a structure that we can make that transformation I think we can make it work. so dan if i if i can also add i mean what one of the key things for me has been to teach my students that the writing that they're doing is a process not a finished product and open educational resources are a process so when we're creating, the first thing to do is to create that core resource that can then be enhanced. And I unfortunately think that a lot of these enhancements that allow smaller population access to the OER, those are going to be enhancements. If we start looking at creating a text, an OER out of the box that is available to everyone, no impediments, the cost will just be prohibitive, despite the well-meaning university funding, which doesn't exist really anywhere. Uh, I don't think it's reasonable to put that as a standard for an OER to be an OER. It, it is a process and with time and with money and with more, frankly, with more teachers, educators, researchers getting involved, the quality will go up, the accessibility will go up, and we will hopefully replace publishers with these team developed open resources. Absolutely. Um, so thank you for that uh, wonderful answer. We have another question in the chat. Unfortunately, we are out of time today, so maybe that's a, another conversation for a different time um, about OER and uh, Indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing. Um, it's a great question. Um, but thank you everyone for coming today. Um, thank you for your, all your great questions uh, and thank you to the panelists, it's the great perspectives and um, a special thank you to Jordan Habib for her administration as well. And um, I think that's all I have to say. Uh, take care and thanks for coming. 
And I guess one last thing is I found the word I was looking for and that was summarize. It came to me eventually. So that's my little recovery. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Dan. You've done a great job. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having us. You're Thank possible. you very much. Thank you. Yes, Bye -bye. thanks. Very enjoyable. Thank you.